Good evening, good evening, and good evening. I am Reverend Joseph Raglan, and welcome to Trinity Community Church Bible Study. Tonight, we are on the second chapter of the book of the prophet Joel. Now, uh, before we begin, uh, go ahead and get your Bibles and turn to the book of Joel. And I'll wait and I'll do that at the same time while I wait for you. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, um, again, we are uh, going through a series of the minor prophets. Um, and Joel is the first one. I will be doing uh, the prophet of Joel. And... Um, the other members, um, of our team will do other minor prophets. Um, so let us begin with the recap. Now, last week we talked about the book of Joel and what we said was Joel understood that God was intervening in the lives of the people. He also understood that there was something going on that hadn't had, hadn't happened before. And this was the, um, the devastation of the land due to uh, the locusts. And what was happening was the locusts were ravishing everything. And what it did was it made life more difficult because it got to the, the locusts devoured the crops and um, those that that uh, depended on on uh, production of crops like farmers, uh, they couldn't make any money. The people didn't have any food. Um, uh, they didn't have, uh, they weren't able to make wine. And so uh, the animals couldn't eat because they needed uh, the vegetation um, to survive that the locusts had destroyed. And so this was a warning by Joel um, to the children of Israel that saying, listen, we have really stopped following God and there is a price that we have to pay for that. Now, if we turn back to God, repent and show our sincerity, God will indeed forgive us and um, he will protect us and provide for us. So uh, last week, we uh, he says, listen, um, hear this, all you elders. And he was saying, have you ever seen or, 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 or heard of anything happening like this in the land? But your forefathers? No, we haven't. And so um, what has happened is the locusts have taken over and destroyed everything. And it was almost like um, uh, a raging attack and ruined everything. So from the vines that grew the grapes to all the crops. So everyone was, was in need because they were devastated. And so now, um, after the recognition of this, what was asked was, we need to repent. People, we need to repent. And we need to show God that we that we that we're sorry for offending Him, and that we really need uh, uh, to turn from our wicked ways and turn toward God. And so, that was pretty much where we left off at in chapter one, um, just understanding that the day of the Lord is coming, and because the day of the Lord is coming, we are here, and. We need the Lord. We actually need God's uh, protection and help. 
But if we are opposed in our actions to everything that God has asked us to do, then we need to change that. So that's that's where we left off. Um, he says, to you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the open pastures, and the flames have burned up all the fields. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up, and the fire has devoured the open pastures. So basically what has happened is they are living in a time of need, and the only help they can get has to come from the Lord. Okay, so let us begin with chapter 2. And I will begin where it says the army of locusts. Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spring across the mountain, a large and mighty army comes. Such has never was of old, nor ever will be in the age to come. So let's stop right there for a minute. What Joel is saying is like, listen, situation is bad. It's dire. And we need to get on God's side in order to get through this. Okay? So let, let, let's, let's continue. He says, verse 3, Before the fire devours, behind them a flame blazes. Before them, the land was like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. This, this army of locusts have destroyed everything, caused the land to be dry. And, you know, with, with dry land and hot day, it, 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 it can start a fire. So the devastation was almost overwhelming. And it says, they have the appearance of horses. They gallop along like cavalry, with a noise like that of chariots. They leap over the mountaintops like crackling fire, consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. At the sight of them, nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They march all in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through defenses without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city. They run along the walls. They climb into houses like thieves. They enter through the window. Now, understand this. Man has the ability to think and rationalize. And a lot of times what we will do is we think because of our stature and because of, of um, our intelligence that we are actually in control of things. This army of locusts attacked like warriors. They actually went into the land and devastated it. The book says that they, they charge like warriors, that they scale the wall like soldiers, that they go straight ahead and attack, and they don't break rank. 
So think about this. God has commanded the locusts to attack the fields, to attack the land, to attack the crops, to attack the vegetation, to do all of this and the people are under attack. And because there are so many, and because they are so determined in their mission, there is nothing left. Devastated. So he's saying, listen, these locusts are, are, are vicious, unrelenting. They are like an army and we are under attack. Let's continue. Verse 10. Before them the earth shakes. The sky trembles. The sun and the moon are darkened. And the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number. And mighty are those who obey his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? So now, in chapter 2, Joel says, listen. These locusts are attacking us as though another nation was coming to invade. And God is at the head of this army. This is God's doing. This is not some foreign uh, 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 people who came to take over. God has commanded these locusts to devastate the land. And why? Because the people of God have turned against God. The people of God, who God has chosen as his own, said, you know what? That's okay. I'm going to deal with this, that, and the other. And, you know, later for you, God, I'm going to live my life. But that's not what the agreement was. The agreement was, you are my people, and I will take care of you. And I will have to remind you that you are my people. And those that don't come around will have to pay the consequence. So, Joel is saying, listen, it is unfathomable what has happened. We cannot understand fully the effects that this army of locusts has done to the land, to our way of living, to, to everything that we've done. Our whole world has changed. And again, uh, compare that to the coronavirus pandemic and how this virus, whom we cannot see with the naked eye, but know that the death tolls have risen and people have died and gotten sick and, and um, everything in our world had stopped. And we had to deal with that. I mean, think about it. Most people enjoyed their lives. They did what they wanted to do. They went to the football games. They went out to eat, they went to the bars, they went to the clubs, they uh, did their sporting events, they did whatever they wanted to do. And all of a sudden, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we were told, stay in your homes, make sure you don't go out unless it's absolutely necessary. And when you do, cover up and wear a face mask. 
So, just like this swarm of locusts that changed the way of life for the people of Zion, we too had a change in our lifestyle. We too had a life altering event that has changed us. So what does Joel say that we should do next? Verse 12. He says, render your heart. He says, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings, Drink offerings for the Lord your God. So now, what Joel is saying is, look, God is using this as an illustration to say, listen, you are my people. You need to turn from your wicked ways and come back to me. You are my people. I love you. But th there's a, a requirement. And this requirement has to do with you turning your heart away from sin and turning it back toward God. So please, people, let's surrender our heart. Let's, let's not just put on these garments, but let's sincerely focus on turning our attention back to God. And then he says, who knows? He may stop the calamity and give us a blessing for doing so. But one thing is clear. The day of the Lord is here and it is up to us to honor God especially during this time because he is abounding in love. He will forgive us, but we have to do our part. Please, let's change how we're doing things. So then it goes on. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and let the bride her chamber. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why, why should they say among the people, where is their God? Let's think about that for a second. This bad thing has happened. And Joel is saying, listen, this is a sign. God wants us to change our ways. He wants us to turn around. He wants us to be closer to him. He wants us to ask him for help. 
Basically, he wants us to humble ourselves and cry out to him and say, have mercy on us, have pity on us, do not scorn us, do not make us a laughing stock, do not have the other nations say, well, where is their God? He says, get everybody together. Old, the young, the, 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 the bridegroom, the bride, get everybody together. Call the priests and tell them, listen, we have to repent. Cry out to the Lord, ask him for help, ask him to stop this. Collectively, it is a reminder that your life is not your own. You belong to the Lord. And God is doing this to remind you, you are my children. And you need to be reminded exactly whose you are. And now, in order to do so, let's repent. Let's 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 turn back. Let's say, you know what, God, you know what, we were wrong. I'm I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry. I am so sorry that 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 we even got off track. But listen, you are a merciful God. You are all powerful God. We love you. We worship you. We're fasting. We're praying. We're doing everything to let you know sincerely. We see the error of our ways, and we are turning towards you. Okay? So let's go to verse 18. The Lord's answer. Then the Lord will be jealous for his land and take pity on his people. I am sending you grain new wine and oil enough to satisfy you fully never again will i make you the object of scorn to the nations i will drive the neighboring army far from you pushing into a parched and bar barren land with its front columns going into the eastern sea and those in the rear into the western sea and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Be not afraid, O land, be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid, O wild animals. Open the pastures are, uh, for the open pastures are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. He has sent you, he sends you in abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains, as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain, and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I have sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel and that I am the Lord your God, that there is no other. Never again will the people be shamed. So, God will answer. It says here he will restore the land. He'll bring the rains. He will also make sure that 
not only will you have enough to eat, you will eat until you are full. He says, I will make sure that the trees will bear fruit, that the, um, the uh, fig tree and the vine will yield their riches. You're going to have oil. You're going to have wine. And it will overflow. I am the Lord. I can do this. Because you have turned to me and you have repented. You know, all God is asking us is to understand that he is in control and he is worthy to be praised. That these other nations who are doing their own thing are not his children. They are not the ones he made a covenant with. They are not the ones that he said that he would watch over. He said, I will watch over you. And if I am to watch over you, I want you to praise and worship me as your God. And the people hadn't done that. They had gotten so far away from God and looking up what other nations did and following their customs and 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 things. And God was like, wait a minute. Did you forget? Let me show you. I can take you out just like this. But because you are my people and because I love you so much and because you have turned from your wicked ways, I can make amends and turn all this around. But you have to be sincere in your heart and you have to do it as a community. So, God says that he will work wonders. He will do these things. And he wants other nations to know that you are my people and I am your God. And there is none other like me. Because it seems you have forgotten. It seems as though you think you can do your own thing without any repercussions. Well, guess what? I, the Lord, your God, says no. I have the final say. And I am merciful if you heed my warning. If you heed and do what you're supposed to do, we can straighten this out. But I wanted to show you, I had to show you that I am the God. All these other gods that other people are worshiping. No, it is I. It is I, the God of Israel. Who can save you and will save you. If you live up to your part of our bargain. I'll be your God and you be my people. So, let's go to verse 28. The day of the Lord. So, God answers the people and he says, listen, I'm going to do all this stuff to turn it around and you will be blessed. So, the day of the Lord. Okay. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For, the Mount, for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, 
there will be a deliverance as the Lord has said among the survivors, those the Lord calls. Now, what are we saying? We are saying this. No matter how bad it gets, no matter what is going on, turn to God with a sincere heart. Turn to God, confessing your sins. Turn to God and ask for help. It is with humility that we should approach God. It is asking him not only to save us, but to protect and provide for us. Because that's what he said he would do. And that's what he wants to do. But... We have to do our part. We have to call on God. We have to turn from our wicked ways. And we have to let him know that we realize we have no control. Only God has the control. So that was chapter two of the book of Joel. And next week, we'll go into chapter three. But if you've got nothing else out of this, understand this, that God is always in control. Even when we don't know it, even when we don't think it, God is always in control and God always has the last word. So read your Bible, pray to you, God, and be blessed. I'm Reverend Joseph Ragland. We'll see you next week.